But now we have our keynote address for the day from the Mayor of Christchurch, Leanne Garzio. The title of her talk is Good News. You're more prepared than you think. Let's hope you're right, Leanne. <laughs> um, just by way of introduction, uh, Leanne has been the Mayor of Christchurch since October 2013. Prior to that, she was a Member of Parliament for some 23 years. During that period, she held numerous ministerial portfolios, including commerce, accident compensation, immigration, senior citizens, uh, minister for disabled issues, and no doubt other things as well, Leanne. Um, so welcome today. Thank you for coming and spending your day with us, and we look forward very much to your comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I think my contribution is intended to help join the dots between the different sessions this morning and, and to reflect about what we will hear this afternoon. I usually have a theme for my presentations, a quote from people like uh, Ram Emanuel when he was the um, Chief White House Chief of Staff. Uh, he's now the Mayor of Chicago. Uh, you never let a serious crisis go to waste, and what I mean by that it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. Now, you could, you could apply the Naomi Klein's shock doctrine interpretation to this statement, and yes, that is something to be alert to, because there are those who would take advantage of the shock of a disaster um, to push through agendas that would otherwise be untenable. But for me, there is an incredibly powerful sense of optimism in the phrase it's an opportunity to do things you think you could never do before. And this is the sense of anything's possible in Christchurch right now. There is literally life in vacant spaces. Gap filler, greening the rubble, festival of transitional architecture, even our restart mall, the Carbord Cathedral. These are the things that the New York Times and Lonely Planet write about when they exhort people to come to Christchurch. The sense of innovation, creativity, humour, wit and flair, these are the traits that will be forever embedded in our city's DNA. However, all of this was possible before the earthquakes happened, but there was nothing to disrupt the natural order of things, nothing to disrupt the status quo. And now we must seize the opportunity that our experience offers to do things we thought we could never do before. But that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. Today my theme is from the San Francisco Civil Defence website, SF72, which says this, Good news, you're more prepared than you think. And I think this is a great message for a civil defence website. I came across it in the book written by the chair of the Rockefeller Foundation, Judith Roden, called The Resilience Dividend. I mention this because Christchurch and now Wellington, as you've heard, have become part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. And the reasons why the Foundation chose resilience as its centennial challenge and why the focus is on cities as opposed to countries are captured in a book that inspires us to understand that resilience means so much more than bouncing back or even bouncing forward. Um, it introduces us to the notion that communities can literally thrive in the face of adversity. Judith Rodden ends the book with this powerful statement. There is no ultimate or end state of resilience, but by working together to build resilience to the greatest degree possible, we can reduce our reliance on crisis as a driver of change and instead deliberately take the future into our own hands for the well-being of our families, our communities, our cities and indeed the planet we all share. You will note the focus on families, communities and cities. This to me is the reason why a framework that is government to government, unless it is translated to a meaningful tool at the city level, will never achieve its goals. There were senior people who had never heard of the Hyogo Framework for Action or the concept of disaster risk reduction despite being fully involved in the Christchurch recovery. How could we adopt the Sendai Framework if we don't make it meaningful at the city level? So why do I theme my presentation, Good News, You're More Prepared Than You Think? 
The focus on preparedness in the Sendai framework has been expanded, as we will hear this afternoon, to include Build Back Better in recovery, which includes community resilience, rehabilitation and reconstruction. I often say that in the preparedness stage, we are very good at preparing for the response in the immediate aftermath. And this is the get ready, get through, um, the three days' worth of food, looking after yourself and your loved ones for those three days or more. But my experience is that there is nothing really that prepares us for what happens then, what happens next in terms of medium to long term recovery. But what I found myself saying at Sendai um, was that our experience showed that there were things happening before the earthquake struck that made us much better prepared for the longer term recovery than we would have thought. We just didn't see it that way um, because none of them had anything to do with disaster preparedness, or so we thought. And to be honest, until Sendai, I hadn't really thought about it that way either. And this is why I've become a champion of resilience and why I like the phrase, you're more prepared than you think. This is one of the slides that I presented at Sendai. I described the image as a virtuous circle. It connects response, recovery and resilience in a way that begins and ends with resilience. Now, right in the middle of this um, rather cluttered picture, for those of you who've been around a while, you'll recognise the image of the Ottawa Charter. Um, enable, mediate, advocate. That's the language of the Ottawa Charter. Develop personal skills and strengthen community action. Create supportive environments and reorient health services. And as you can see, it fits very neatly within the 100 Resilient City Framework, the inner circle represents health and well-being, society and economy, infrastructure and environment, and leadership and strategy. The outer layers, um, they show uh, the benefits of each of these and in, in, in so doing also capture the risks of breakdown in any one of them. Health in all policies is one way of describing this, and I heard one of the speakers say before, why don't we just follow what health promotion does? And actually, it's a very, very good idea um, to be thinking about it this way. It's all about building resilience before, during and after an event. The greater the resilience, and I just want you to, I'll just flip this backwards and forwards, can you see what, see what I do here? It's quite cool, right? See? So, the more resilience, oops, that's my favourite photo. Um, that the more resilience, the um, quicker the response and the more enduring the recovery. So, and, and it feeds on itself. It is literally a virtuous circle. And I know somebody else used that phrase today, but this is my virtuous circle here. There's another um, phrase that, um, that comes up on the uh, San Francisco Civil Defence website, and it says, actual emergencies look more like people coming together than cities falling apart. And that is the Christchurch story. Neighbourhoods came together, supported by communities throughout the city and beyond. The range of reviews, inquiries and reports that seek to identify lessons learned in terms of the Christchurch story have got to be synthesised in some way but must also reflect these community-led elements as well as the pre-existing story. What was going on in Christchurch before the disaster that helped with the response and the recovery? And it was great hearing Bruce Glavovich um, today because he said exactly the same thing at a seminar I went to in, um, I think it was March 2011, after the February earthquake. And I, it really stuck with me about identifying pre-existing vulnerabilities. But what I've discovered since then is that there are pre-existing strengths as well, and it's identifying those strengths that they become the building blocks to recovery and resilience. And I think the concern that I have is that there's a real risk in a post-disaster environment that we fail to recognise these building blocks as I would describe them and replace them with alternative, unfamiliar structures thereby inadvertently undermining the capacity of communities to contribute to their own recovery in a positive and collaborative way. Um, my message today is how important it is to recognise these building blocks as preparedness initiatives when considering a disaster risk management framework because they can shape both the nature and the speed of recovery and build resilience at the same time. This is why I say that leadership for this has to be at the local level. And let me just show you some concrete examples of this. 
The model of our local health system in Christchurch serves as an example to us all. Work had already been done on integrating a healthcare model that was integrated both vertically and horizontally. So within the health sector, with the home at the very heart, primary, secondary and tertiary services are seen as part of the myriad of aspects of city life mutually reinforcing each other and able to be embraced by local government and non-government organisations. Pandemic planning had been successfully utilised to contain a small outbreak of H1N1 in one of the areas um, hard hit by the earthquake. This was a couple of years before the earthquake. It is not by chance that there was no outbreak of food or waterborne disease that could have affected vulnerable neighbourhoods who were without power for nearly three weeks. After all of the messages that we learned back then were reinforced in the weeks after the earthquake. But note that the logo on this, it's not the DHB, it's not the Ministry of Health, it's the local city council. This was a health issue owned by the city and there is a message in that as well. This is one of my favourite pictures. Um, this, is, um, this is the example of um, investing $6 million in a, in a um, this is a publicly owned lines company, Orion, spent $6 million on all of its substations. It sold the one on the, on the other side, the, the, you're right, um, it sold that one to a um, scout club and they didn't reinforce it. It protected that decision to spend $6 million protected over $60 million worth of asset, but more importantly, it meant that the power wasn't off for more than three months. I'm just interested to know how resilient the Wellington networks are. Another example relates to the way local councils had worked together, and all of us worked together to create a Greater Christchurch Urban Development Strategy which identified areas for greenfields and brownfields development, including intensification, right through to 2041. Guess what position we were in after the earthquakes when it came to land use and having to address freeing up land for development very, very quickly. Now, I just want to make the point that this document went a lot further than land use, and actually it could have been the basis for the recovery strategy for Christchurch, given its centrality of leadership, uh, good governance and leadership and resilience, utterly embedded within the UDS, the Urban Development Strategy. But it was the basis for a land use recovery plan that the government was able to get through very quickly and simply would not have been in a position to action so quickly without that background work. And then we've got the networks of um, communities, Te Runanga Onaitahu. I'm afraid that um, that is an untold story, the incredible collaborative networks internally and throughout the South Island and indeed throughout the country, the pouring together of um, Māori wardens, runanga service providers and Māori health professionals meant affected areas could be um, supported effectively. Local communities ready and willing to be self-activated. Examples like the Time, Time Bank as part of Project Littleton, Aranui Community Trust, which highlights the benefits of asset-based community development, the role of faith-based organisations, residents associations, sports clubs. And then there are the emergent groups, can soon. We've got a Ministry of Awesome in Christchurch now. I mean, how good's that? A network designed to ensure that um, affected communities had a voice, and then we had a political arm, we can, out of Cancern, because they couldn't make that sort of kind of political um, statement. The Student Volunteer Army, which utilised a capacity that wasn't recognised as an asset by the traditional response agencies. So, to sum up, um, and I, I think learning and sharing lessons was very much what came out of Sendai for me. Every single session that I went to, every single um, comment that was made is that we must learn the lessons that we have experienced and share them with others. Local leadership um, is essential um, as are strong community relationships. And I loved hearing um, Mayor Celia talk about the neighbourhood um, exper experience here in Wellington. That is precisely the sort of investment that I'm talking about there. 
Cities need to lead on disaster risk reduction and building resilience is where we begin. Communities have to be involved in evaluating the lessons learned. It is equally important that we learn from what we get right as well as what we get wrong. And this is not for attribution of blame. In fact, it's essential that we don't. It is for understanding, developing understanding so we can genuinely share those lessons. We need to expect the unexpected and actually prepare people for that. We don't know what's going to happen or when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. Expect the unexpected. We need to forget conventional top-down solutions to pre-disaster recovery, um, pre-disaster preparedness for recovery. We need to understand what is already going on, but put a post-disaster lens on it. Look what's going on in your own communities and put a what would that look like in a post-disaster environment? What could we suddenly repurpose to a different um, set of circumstances? We need to, um, I've, I, I guess I've highlighted some examples. They may, they may give uh, others a clue about what they should be looking for, but also potentially planning for um, some other things if you see um, a gap in your own areas. And I, somebody else said this today, always go to where the people are, don't expect them to come to you, and make sure they are equipped with the best available evidence and expertise to assist them with planning. And remember that it's the planning, not the plan, that really matters in the end. And whatever you do, don't set up another committee or decision-making framework that could undermine the competence of communities to lead their own recovery planning, which is something that builds um, resilience. And I just thought, and um, I probably have gone over time, I have, yes, well, I'll just say one last thing. It's just a, a personal postscript for me as a former politician and now mayor is that the regulators need to think about why we've developed rules and regulations that are designed to protect individuals and communities, often in the wake of tragedy or disaster, and ask ourselves whether we have inadvertently stripped away some of our natural capacity to take responsibility for risk. Have we transferred risk from communities to governments, leaving potentially potentially leaving communities ill-prepared for when the rules just have to be ignored. Taking this theme a step further, could we help build resilience by helping people better understand risk and transferring responsibilities back to communities ahead of such a situation? I think of communities who want to fix their earthquake-damaged jetties or local community facilities. They have resources in their communities. Surely the Health and Safety and Employment Act wasn't designed to stop communities doing things they could do otherwise um, on their own properties if the asset wasn't publicly owned or available for public use. I don't come here to start a debate on that issue, but it is worth thinking about doing things for communities, no matter how well intentioned, may undermine the very characteristics we need communities to have if we are to achieve the goals of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Thank you.